I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Archaeology Committee of the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based here in Gramercy Park with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, and it's a wonderful exhibition here and downstairs as well, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. For more information about the Arts Club, visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. On behalf of the President, the Board of Governors, and the Archaeology Committee, I am delighted to welcome our audience to an extraordinary presentation by Peter Herdrich entitled, Preservation and Threats to World Culture, Lessons Learned. But prior to speaking, permit me some highly personal remarks related to our committee intertwined with September 11th and we all know today's the anniversary. For those of you who suffered on this horrific day 22 years ago, there is little more that I can say other than I'm sorry for your grief, that you lost a loved one or had your health impaired. My deepest sympathy to those so affected. My heart goes out to those individuals impacted by the worst. Life as we knew it was upended and nothing can truly bring back those more sanguine times. But I consider it essential to learn from the past, to try to come to terms with the past, no matter how painful. I wish to recount my own experiences, which contribute to tonight's introduction. Thank you for allowing me to share my story, and thank you for being present on this, an unfathomable anniversary. Just before 9 a.m., I received a telephone call from the publisher of an art newspaper for which I wrote, who told me to turn on TV. Both of us, being Jewish, I assumed something had occurred in Israel. Surely evil can't happen here. You are all aware of what I saw. Similar to many trying to trace the whereabouts of loved ones, I frantically immediately attempted to reach my son, who could have been any place in New York. I went out to vote in the primary election, though realized my selection would prove somewhat fruitless. But I didn't want to allow anyone to limit my rights as a citizen. I next withdrew $500 in cash from the bank and embarked upon massing food shopping. At every payphone I passed, with feelings of panic increasing, I endeavored to locate my son, and later remained at home, still trying to speak with him, until I finally succeeded. He was then a teaching assistant in the Department of Computer Science at Columbia, and to segue into the future, became a firefighter soon afterwards. He's my hero, exemplifying if I am not for others, what am I? When you know what danger is and you're willing to assume the risks in order to help people, especially those you do not know, that's heroic. I realize others also undertook something similar and they're all heroes. My telephone fortuitously functioned. This is why I believe in retaining landlines for those eliminating yours. I truly believe in retaining them. And since my apartment was located on a low floor, neighbors requested to use it. As elevators no longer functioned, my closest friend in the building remained for a few days since she lived higher up. Even now, certain noises we heard trigger feelings of anguishness as I spontaneously recall the horrendous sounds at all hours of trucks filled with remains careening by my windows. When the Frick Museum reopened on September 13th, 
I sought the emotional comfort of Rembrandt's magisterial self-portrait from 1658, in which he transforms himself into a welcoming prophet. He seems alive, projecting a message of comfort, saying, yes, the present is filled with inexplicable horrors, but have courage, for there will be a better future. I also recall listening to tape music in the small auditorium adjacent to the garden court, but perhaps that occurred on another visit. Classical music has always provided solace to me. And I'll tell you that the Frick is closed on Mondays. I went there yesterday to see the painting, and it's, it's still palpable in my life. I was then teaching courses in ancient and Italian Renaissance art at the New School. Photos, photos of the missing appeared on the walls. It was impossible to discuss beauty and smile after repeatedly encountering those flyers. I commenced escorting my students through museums, galleries, more museums, auction houses, museums once again, loath to return to the classrooms on 11th Street, and ultimately retired after over 25 years of joyously teaching. In those days, Reports in the media and newspaper articles abounded with anti-Muslim sentiment. Yes, hate those individuals involved, but don't stigmatize an entire group. No one should feel alone and isolated. Additionally, I noticed that numerous Sikh taxi drivers cut their hair and no longer wore their customary turbans. To these individuals, I routinely inquired, although I knew the answer in advance, whether they were Sikhs, the name made it obvious, and quickly said my son's best friend in college was a Sikh, and he always remarked how delicious the food was. I hoped to be part of the solution and wondered what to do, ultimately concluding archaeology's emphasis on sheer humanity furnished an answer. In 2005, Diane Bernhardt sponsored a trip for National Arts Club members to visit the impressive Salvador Dali exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. En route and on the return, conversations flowed. I spoke with club president Orrin James, seated near me in the bus, about the premature demise of archaeology evenings with their global concerns. Wondrous discussions, programs often coordinated with articles appearing in archaeology magazine, copies of which were generally distributed to the audience. Alden challenged me that day, adding that I would have his support if I could accomplish anything tangible. Shortly thereafter, he suggested a meeting with club member Peter Young, editor of Archaeology magazine. Ultimately, one glorious summer day, the three of us enjoyed lunch and analyzed ways to merge our individual visions into a singular creative forum. Within a year, once previously independent talks germinated into a series, and the Archaeology Committee was born and founded. On October 14, 2009, the National Arts Club presented the Medal of Honor for Distinguished Coverage in the Field of Archaeology Worldwide to Archaeology Magazine. For this unique event, Assistant Chair Lynn Mayacall with the Blue Turban sketched a pregnant dolly, that is to say the head of dolly replete with twirling mustache, surmounted on top of the body of the Venus of Willendorf. Her drawing was accompanied by the droll question, who would have imagined that Dolly, exemplar of fantasy surreal, would have been capable of giving birth to an archaeology committee? <coughs> Before this grand event could occur, however, three eminent speakers needed to be selected. 
Peter Young selected Peter Herdrich for our extraordinary gold medal celebration. And I will say as a side, we're planning another celebration right now for the American School of Classical Studies at Athens on January 24th. And in Ophelia, we met at Morel's Wine Bar and Cafe on West 48th Street, where he would select what we would enjoy that afternoon. Obviously, this was the start of a beautiful friendship. And the first of his collaborations with the club, where Peter would likewise prove a welcome presence at many lectures given by others. Subsequently, CEO of the Archaeological Institute of America, his vision for a National Archaeology Day resulted in a congressional proclamation, which he graciously presented to Diane Bernhardt during our second salute to National Archaeology Day on October 25, 2012. And I tell you all that I have a photograph from that day. I wish I could have shown it. Peter's there, Diane Bernhardt, you gave her the proclamation, and Ambassador Paula Sapinano uh, from wonderful Cyprus. Uh, I was told my photograph wasn't sharp enough. I'm sorry, I have it on my cell phone if someone wants to see it later. <laughs> In any case, from its inception, he was involved with the educational initiative, speaking with students at Hunter College High, and supplying Washington Irving High School with numerous copies of Archaeology magazine. On November 2019, in this very room, he discussed the battle for our shared cultural heritage relating the subject to the Antiquities Coalition, which he had co-founded, established to stem illicit looting and global sales of antiquities. Its various efforts include projects focusing on the MENA region, that is the Middle East and North Africa. He works with local partners, though not exclusively on archaeological collections. And this evening will treat digital documentary, intangible heritage preservation, and material culture. A graduate of Columbia University, where he also studied arts administration in the graduate school, Peter believes he was the only person to ever run a learned society, the Archaeological Institute of America, and produce a network TV show. Kindly join with me and the Archaeology Committee in welcoming returning lecturer Peter Herdrich. Peter Thank you, Ms. Shelfer. Uh, that couldn't have been a more lovely introduction. And, and I, I too tried to wrestle with what to say on 9-11, and I cut it is what I did, because I didn't feel like I was doing it justice, and I feel like you did, so thank you for that. In the sense of that, I would also like to just remark on the fact that we have a, another terrible tragedy in Morocco that is going on, and if people can uh, support the people of Morocco in their time of need, that would be a great thing to do, too. So, uh, uh, Right, so today is the kickoff of the season. So congratulations on another season, and you can count on me to come and see some of the uh, tremendous speakers that you have lined up already for, for this year. And uh, I want to just start the season in a way that I think is very appropriate, which is to ask for a round of applause for Michelle, who told you the origin story of the archaeology community, the, or the, the rebirth story, the phoenix story of, of, the, archaeology, of the archaeology committee and how, uh, how she was behind all that. So congratulations to you as well. All right, so let's talk, about, let's talk about this. Let's talk about preservation and threats to world culture, lessons learned. Uh, what I'd like to say is that the world's historic patrimony is something that people across the globe mutually respect and want preserved. Uh, and that's the topic of our discussion tonight. We'll discuss the challenges we face uh, in cultural heritage preservation, and I'll 
note uh, what I see as working in the field. I'll also offer some topics that are rising in consciousness of the uh, heritage preservation community. And finally, I'll discuss what we can do to preserve and protect sites and materials, combat looting and illicit trafficking, and how to face up to the emergencies that threaten the historic patrimony that we, that we look after uh, at the sites, uh, at sites in material culture and cultural practices. We don't want to see them overrun and lost. Uh, I have directed uh, cultural heritage projects on the, with on-the-ground partners across the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and here's what I do. I work mainly in two capacities as the executive project director, developing projects, finding partners, raising money, and implementing cultural heritage projects from soup to nuts. Uh, I've, directed about, I've directed nine or ten of these, depends how you count them. Uh, additionally, I work with governments and organizations who are locally responsible for culture on strategies and long-range planning, particularly around digital projects. Another way to look at, the, at, at what I do uh, comes from my daughter, Wen. Uh, when asked what her father does, she answered, um, well, all day long, he talks to people named Ahmed and Abdul Hamid very loudly on the computer. And that is not an, that is not an inaccurate description of what it is that I do, honestly. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also the co-founder of the Antiquities Coalition. The Antiquities Coalition is an NGO based in D.C. Uh, whose mission is to combat looting and the illicit trafficking in cultural materials. The AC works uh, on policy and building political will in this fight, and I activate that policy on the ground with efforts uh, with local partners in various um, ways to preserve and protect cultural materials, mm -hmm. mainly in the area of digital preservation. Much of my work is done at collections including at museums. I also work on documentary heritage at libraries, archives, and manuscript collections. Our team builds inventories, documents collections with digital photography, and creates data records to produce collections databases. Think of it this way a little bit. If you go to the website of the Met or one of your favorite museums, and you start to look through the collections, you look and you see the paintings that you have, and they have them organized in particular ways, or you can search them in particular ways. Those are the digital records. Those are the digital uh, databases that we built. Um, uh, uh, the important thing about that, too, is to try to make those accessible to the public. That's really an important uh, part of all the work we do. I work with the Council on Library and Information Resources, another leading U.S.-based NGO. Uh, they're my regular partner on the documentary heritage side of things, uh, and that's part of their worldwide effort to preserve and protect the world's documentary heritage. And I thank the staff and associates of both those organizations for all their good work. Just to tell you, on the left here, that's, uh, that is um, at, the, at the site of Lalish. Lalish is in northern Iraq. That is the holiest city in the Yazidi uh, community. Uh, on the right, that is at the uh, Center for the Digitization of Eastern Manuscripts. That's in Erbil. And that is uh, a, it's a polyglot Bible from uh, about 1000 AD. Those are among the, uh, among the projects that I've been working on. All right, so critically, uh, I work with local partners on all these projects like those, uh, mostly in conflict and post-conflict zones and areas under threat. Now I'm going to talk about a number of these, and we're going to get a whirlwind tour of Algeria, of Egypt, of Iraq, and of Yemen, and the experiences I have gained uh, from this work and from the lessons I've learned from implementing these projects. And you might ask, you know, why is this important? And the reason is simple. It's we're still facing an emergency. We're still losing cultural heritage day in and day out. It's not a secret, and it doesn't take, uh, you know, f look too deep into the headlines to see where it's happening. But it also happens in, in places that are uh, less well-known. Uh, you can see it in, the, in questions of, of collecting at museums, collecting at museums here in New York. Uh, and so we need to be aware of that. We need to be uh, alert to that, and we need to know that um, that there are things that we can do about that. We'll talk a little bit about that. So I wanted to tell you uh, uh, about a couple of things. Um, let me see where I am here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back one. Um, I want to talk about our list of uh, collaborators. I'm, I'm a little... Sorry. Everybody. Uh, okay, I think I have the wrong 
Um, I have the wrong PowerPoint loaded here. So, so <laughs> I'm going imp to improvise here a little bit. All right, I'm going to tell you about our collaborators, and I have a list of these on my other PowerPoint, mm -hmm. but I'm going to just read them to you. Because I think what it illustrates is it illustrates the breadth of the work we do and the people with whom we work. Here in the United States, we work, as I said, with the Antiquities Coalition and the Council on Library and Information Resources. In Egypt, we work with the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation and the Kurdish Heritage Institute. Uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Egypt, it's the Egyptian Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation. In Iraq, it's the Kurdish Heritage Institute, the Syriac Heritage Museum, uh, Yazda, the Yazidi Social Services Organization, the Center for the Digitization of Eastern Manuscripts, the Assyrian Aid Society, and the Sinjar Academy. In uh, Yemen, we work with the National Museum of Aden the general, and the General Organization of Antiquities and Museums. And in Algeria, we work with the Ministry of Culture, the National Library, uh, the National Manuscript Center, and the Bardo Museum. It's a, it's a wide-ranging list of collaborators we have, and I think um, that I haven't even mentioned individuals or people with whom we're affiliated, but not actually in, in, uh, on project work with. Uh, I've probably overlooked somebody. I apologize to, for that. But the point is, though, that there's, and this is our first lesson learned, uh, it is that partnership is critical. You can't do this without partners. The, co the, the, the field is too complex. You need too many people. You need contrib contributions from so many people. And that's why we look to people like you, people who have specific skills who can help us. We need archaeologists. We need teachers. We need diplomats. We need technologists. We need fundraisers. We need business people. And I can go on and on. Because the fight against looting and illicit trafficking, the efforts to, to do what we can to protect, preserve and protect our cultural heritage, are such that um, we need help from all those people because it's too big a problem for any one person to get, a, get their arms around singularly. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is that uh, in order to, uh, to preserve and protect what we have, you've got to work with the custodians of the heritage. Uh, and it, it has to be with the people on the ground and the people who are responsible custodians for that heritage. And I'll give you an example. And it is again back with the Yazidis. In 2014, you'll probably remember what happened to the Yazidi community in Iraq. When the so-called Islamic State attacked them, it's been determined to have been a genocidal attack. People were killed. Women, were, women and children were sold into slavery. It was an absolutely horrifying ordeal that they had, that they had to uh, endure. And when I went to Iraq to, to work with them the first time, uh, it seemed to me pretty obvious that there was no way that I could possibly understand what they had gone through. There was no way that I could understand their, their, uh, their culture itself. There was no way that I could put that into perspective, and there was no way that I was going to go and tell them what they should do with their culture. It was a revelation to me in the sense that um, what I understood was that it is not up to us, uh, despite the fact that we have skills and despite the fact that we can uh, accomplish things uh, around projects, to tell local communities about their culture about their community heritage. That's not for us to do. And that's, uh, I think, a really important lesson for us. It's one that, that, I, think, um, that I think has, uh, that we've got to keep in mind in all cases. We try to go really in a sense of service as a consequence. We try to say, look, it's your culture. You're responsible. Let us help you however you want. You make the decisions. Uh, and, um, and you can, uh, therefore, uh, present your culture the way you want it presented. Okay, so respect is a very important part of that, right? Respect and a little bit of humility is a very important part of that, and so is the commitment to the work. Uh, another le lesson stems from this, which is a one-word admonition, and that is to go. You have to go. You have to go see the folks. You have to go see where they live. You have to go s meet them. You have to go show that you are uh, committed to the cause that you're working on. You have to go show that you have an interest and that you uh, are going about this in a forthright manner. Sorry. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about, when I say go, I want to tell you about a trip that we took recently to uh, Algeria, to a place called Adrar. Adrar, if, if you can think, think of the map of, I am going to try to draw the map of Africa backwards, right? Okay, it kind of goes like this, and it goes down over here. And in the northwest corner, which 
I think is over here, is Algeria. Algeria is the largest land mass of any uh, country in Africa. And if you were to drop a pin in the middle of that land mass in the Sahara Desert, that is where approximately where a drawer is. It is very far away. And so in a drawer, I met a man whose name is uh, Belfakir A. And he is a conservator. He's a paper conservator. The National Manuscript Center happens to be in that city. And it is the site, it's the locus of, of a manuscript culture that really is of an international class. And it's not easy to get there. It's, it wasn't easy for us to get there. It's not easy for people who study manuscripts to get to either. Uh, but he is, he's a dedicated uh, conservator, paper conservator, and manuscript conservator. And he said to us, um, he said, you know, we're very far away, and we don't get much attention. And we want to thank you for coming to see us. We need equipment, and we need training, because we have a world-class resource here. And I thought about that, and I thought, yeah, you know, they do have a world-class resource there, and they're ignored. They're ignored, and they're, they're fighting uh, their own problems with climate change and with, uh, with violent extremism. And if that's the case, then, yeah, I should get on an airplane, and I should go see him, and we can do, we can do something. And in fact, I have some news about that to tell you about later. OK. So I want to go here to my next point, and that is that uh, as I say, this threat in Algeria is with climate change, and climate change is on everybody's mind. It's obvious we, uh, you know, we don't need to look any further than New York to see what the temperatures have been like this summer. So as those temperatures rise, uh, and as enthusiasts, we're all gripped by the wildfires that ravaged much of the circum-Mediterranean area this summer. We saw them in Greece, we saw them in Italy, we saw them in Algeria, we saw them in Spain. Uh, and we know that this is driven by uh, climate-related temperature uh, but climate, uh, climate change and how it's driving temperatures higher. So I'll give you another example, and it's here. That, those are manuscripts in Algeria in the city of Adrar. That's a collection. You can see how, how it's deteriorated. It's deteriorated for a couple of reasons, mostly because the temperatures are going up. And our research colleagues who, who live in Adrar, who are at the university there, report that as they travel about and visit private libraries, these private libraries that hold these materials, they see fewer and fewer uh, manuscripts each year. They believe that it's a crisis there. And this crisis is, is principally driven uh, by climate change. So I want to just say that um, uh, we have an ongoing project in Algeria we're working with the Ministry of Culture there and at the Bardo Museum. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. There's the Bardo Museum. Uh, the Bardo Museum is their ethnographic and prehistoric museum. Um, you may know that, that Algeria has some of the earliest uh, I, I was going to. I was working on this, and I was thinking to myself, are these are these human settlements? Are they hominin settlements? Uh, they're 2.7 million years old, and so they have an incredible collection over there. That's a, a palazzo from the 18th century, and you can as you can imagine, it's a it's a beautiful place. We went we went there to work on a grant that we had received from the United States Embassy in Algiers, and what we were doing was we were installing a. Uh, we were installing a digitization laboratory, and we were training uh, people from Algerian museums, from six, Algerian, six separate Algerian museums, in the uh, digitization and documentation of collections. That happened earlier this year. That was in uh, May that we did that. OK. I want to I tell you a little bit about uh, Algeria, and you know this is the archaeology committee, so we, we're not going to get by without a shot like this, right? We, we all want to see beautiful archaeological sites. This is the site of Tingad in Algeria, which you may be familiar with or may not. Uh, Algeria is not a well-known country here in the United States at all. It's hard to get to. Its travel is not easy. But uh, take a look at that. It's pretty impressive site. It's a Roman site. It was built in about 100 A.D. during the time of uh, Trajan. And it was, um, it's located in the northeast of the country. Uh, the ruins are noteworthy because it is one of the best examples of Roman urban planning set on a grid plan. So you can see that. You can sort of see the roads there that, that take us around. Um, the, uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has been since 1982. Uh, and 
I sort of put that in as just a little aside because it, you know it's archaeology, and I want to mention the archaeology, of course. So uh, here we we go on to some of the other sites. This is um, one. This is a hominid, Hamadid uh, uh, fort from the uh, about 1000 A.D. And this is a 13. Uh, this is a mosque from 1300 A.D. Uh, but that is the Ministry of Culture, and those are our partners there. Um, we began our project about two and a half years ago. We began by looking at the process uh, and strategy of how the Ministry of Culture is implementing, uh, implementing um, the digitization at memory institutions in Iraq. Um, what we did was we organized with them a regional conference. Um, uh, we also, uh, in addition to, to looking at this, uh, the, uh, did the rationalization of, and the digitization of uh, memory institutions, we also organized a regional conference uh, among the Maghreb nations to talk about the threats to privately held manuscripts that are not in possession of national entities. And here we'll see a couple of the libraries that we visited over there. Uh, on the left, that is a, a library that's about an hour west of uh, Adrar. And you can see that it's a facility that has no uh, windows. It is out. I, I can tell you the little story. We drove west for about an hour and from this small town of 8,000 in the center of the Sahara. And I don't know why we turned where we did. It had to be GPS driven because I don't know why we went off on this particular path. But we went up and down and we went and found ourselves in this town. We were greeted, we were greeted in, uh, in an incredibly warm manner. They were very, very happy to see us. Uh, they wanted to show us their manuscripts. Their manuscripts were stunning. And, um, and it is one of the places that, uh, that we're hoping to go back uh, to. One of the things that I was impressed with, though, was why, why was there no windows? And that question was answered for me when I saw bats fly in and out. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, I'm not really a huge fan of bats. And I don't want these bats to land on my head. And everybody, and many of the people in our party sort of put on their baseball caps and said, uh, you know, this is, uh, why, why, what about the bats? Um, and, and I thought about it, and I thought, and I, I wanted to ask, and I didn't know if I should, and I kept my mouth shut. And as we left, um, the person there on the left is actually an Algerian uh, ministry official. And I said, uh, you know, it can't, is it good to have bats in with manuscripts? I did note, I, I want to say, I did note that all the manuscripts were in boxes or on shelves or behind doors or behind glass. And he said, oh yeah, we love the bats. And I said, why is that? He said, well, they eat the insects. And the insects are the threat. The insects are the big threat. It's not the, you know, it's not the uh, bat pooping. It's the, it's the insects that the bats eliminate, hence no windows. And I thought to myself, it was, a, it was a lesson for me because I thought, look, this is, you know, I think I'm so smart, right? I think I know about conservation, preservation, and I'm going to come and I'm going to, this is why you have to be humble about this, right? This is a reinforcement of that same lesson I talked about before. You have to give credit. These communities there, which are, are family and clan based principally and have been collecting um, manuscripts for years and years, I mean hundreds of years. They, they have been extremely good custodians of this material and have kept it in great shape for that long. And so the revelation was, uh, I can learn from them and they can learn from me. And so uh, that is the, I think that's a, a great way to approach this. Uh, on, the, on the right, that is a larger, um, these, these libraries are called Khizana, K-H-I-Z-H-A-N-A -A is the transcription of the Arabic word. And, uh, the Khazana are, as I say, privately held. That privately held is important because it means they don't get any government help. And um, when I was applying for, for, uh, for aid for, for a project uh, uh, with, with the Khazana, one of the people at the funding organization said to me, well, our, our fees are private collectors. Why are we helping private collectors? They must be rich. They must, you know, they probably have, they, if, if you say they have thousands of manuscripts, they're probably very wealthy. And we don't help, you know, we're not here to, we're not here to underwrite the wealthy collecting behavior, collecting behavior of wealthy individuals. And I said, no, no, these are not wealthy people in uh, cosmopolitan areas. These are people in the desert who have been uh, doing this for years. It's an interesting story of, of how 
and people have asked me this, they said, oh, who, you know, it, it's the answer to the question, who knew, right? It's like, who knew that there was such a, there was, that there were so many manuscripts of such age and importance in that area of the world? And as it turns out, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, there is, of course, the east-west route, uh, the, the caravan route that goes across the center of the Sahara, which was taken and developed uh, to a great extent um, to support people going on the Hajj. And if you went in 400 years ago on the Hajj, you had to be a person of means to do that. It took a year to go uh, to Mecca and back. And if you did that, chances were good that you would also collect things along the way. And that you, among the things you would collect would be manuscripts. You might also collect rugs, you might also collect other things too. But manuscripts were particularly good because you were going to educate yourself with those. You had access to them all along the route. Apparently there was big trade and all of that. And, uh, and then you, had, uh, you were able to bring them home, you were able to use them as the basis of a community-based library. So this is one of the reasons why these, are, these, um, these collections are beloved, too, is that they've been working in these communities for years and years. Uh, and when I say years and years, I mean hundreds of years and hundreds of years. So uh, that is um, the story of these Kizana. Uh, that's the National Library in, in Algeria. We also work there. Uh, and there's, and uh, you know, if there's somebody here who could say, to me, that looks like a Persian manuscript, that illustration. But if there's anybody who has any insight who could offer it, I'd appreciate it. I snapped that. It was on display. And I don't read Arabic, so I don't know, I don't know exactly what it was. Anyway, it's, a, it's part of the collection at the National Library. Uh, and now we're going to get back a little bit to um, the questions around cultural heritage preservation. One of the things we did was we built this website on the, web, on the left. It's called Tarathi. Tarathi is the Arabic word for uh, heritage. And what we did was we worked uh, with our partners at the, um, at the ministry to come up with a, basically what would be equivalent to a red list. If you know what a red list is, those are the lists of materials that are likely to be stolen, likely to be looted, likely to be in the uh, black market in any particular country. We worked on that with, the Alger with our Algerian friends, and we turned it into uh, a publication. And I brought my publication today. This is what it looks like. It's pretty simple. And it has, as you can see, it's got examples of the types of materials that you might see uh, that might be looted, that might be stolen, that might have been uh, into, in the black market. This is, has to be an English version. Now, I'm, uh, Michelle mentioned, I, I'm, I'm a former publisher of Archaeology Magazine. And so I thought when we started, well, this will be great. Let's do this. We're going to put this right online, and we're going to make a digital copy, and we're going to save all sorts of money by publishing nothing. Right? That's what I thought. And we did this in consultation with Interpol. And our Interpol friends, when I hatched this, I, my brilliant idea on how this was going to work, uh, they said, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that at all. What you want is you want to publish something like this because it goes here, and that's where your investigators are going to keep it when they go out to the market and start to look around, and then they can take this out, and they can look, and they can say, that looks like that. And that's, how, and that's how it is used mostly by the investigators who use it. These are the investigators on the right. You'll note lots of people in uniform. It's the military, it's the gendarmerie, and it's the customs service who uh, use this most. But we thought, look, we've made this. Why don't we turn it into a website and let's, um, let's put it up online. And anybody who does want to look at it then can. Uh, it's also a great outreach to the public. The public is very interested in this, too. The Algerian public is very enthused about the idea of cultural heritage preservation. They have a lot of it. Uh, okay, so um, that is another part of our ongoing project. We have since gotten a second grant. Uh, I mentioned the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Fund. This is us in May. We're uh, doing some training at the Bardo Museum. As I mentioned, that's uh, Abdel Hamid Salah, my partner on pretty much everything I do. He is the chairman of the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Fund. Uh, and we um, worked there uh, at the Barta Museum to, digitize, to train them to digitize and document their collection. But we did something that was interesting. We, uh, part, of, part of what we do and part of, of, of the reason that we're um, well accepted is because we do a lot of capacity building. We do a lot of training, especially around technical issues. And that is something that is very much desired around the world to learn about uh, 
tech, um, tech questions and tech skills. So uh, Abdel Hamid and I hatched a plan. We had always felt that we should do our, all our training in Arabic. It doesn't make sense to do it in English or in French because you get only half as much education because you spend half your time translating, right? So we thought, well, let's, let's do our, when we do training, let's do it in the language of, of the audience. Uh, Abdel Hamid is, is, of course, Egyptian, so Arabic is his native language, and he does it extremely well. He's also a well-regarded uh, trainer on all cultural heritage issues. So we decided, let's try this. Let's do, uh, at the beginning, let's do the elementary, the introductory part of our training as uh, open, free, and online. And we'll give a certificate for those who complete it. So we, we, we concocted a three-day program around this. He did the teaching. And we put it out on social media with the idea of, let's see what this will, let's see what this will get. Let's see if people respond to this. We got 1,400 people to sign up. We had, it was three times larger than any audience we had ever had in our lives. And really what we did was we put it on, face, on Arabic Facebook. That's really all, that's all we really knew how to do, honestly. And we had so many people who, um, who were eager, who had the thirst for this information. I think there's three reasons why it worked. It's, it was, well, it's free. It's online, so it's easy to get to. Uh, it, had a great, it had a great teacher, and it was in Arabic. And recognizing that, we have now taken that, and now we're working on other ideas where what can we combine with, uh, with online that we can open up and, and train uh, at scale uh, with in-person training, because you do, there is in-person material, there's in-person stuff that you do have to do. So that is what we were doing over at the Bardo Museum. Among the things we did was we built this. This is the beginnings of the um, digitization lab. Uh, this is something very interesting, I think. It's 3D photogrammetry. Now you know, you've certainly seen 3D images of things, and you know that 3D um, computer uh, data can be printed and it can give you uh, all sorts of, of, of ways to use it that's different, especially for 3D objects. You don't need it, obviously, for documentary heritage very much, but uh, in this case, that's our, our teacher on the left, and this is the object that, uh, that we were working with. What you do is that's a turntable, and it shifts like four degrees every time you click the camera. So it goes click, 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 until you circle the entire thing and you get about uh, 77 images. Then there's, um, computer, there's a computer program which stitches those images together and that's how you make your 3D uh, file of, of this kind of object. Uh, one of the things we do, one of our, our, our things that we always do, is we, we, we promote what we do. So we have held, we've been, you saw that, uh, the shot from Tarafi, that was, two, that was a year ago. This was just this past year. We always do uh, uh, media events, and we try to make them look good. And so that's what we're doing here. This is our, our you know, wonderful group of students from, from our Algerian museums, all of whom are ready to go back and digitize and document and make 3D records of, of their material. And there's yours truly. Sitting next to me, uh, to my right on the right hand, <coughs> stage right, to your left uh, on the right hand photograph is Ambassador uh, Elizabeth Aubin. She is the uh, American ambassador to the United States, uh, uh, to, to Algeria. She is. Um, She's uh, an enthusiastic supporter of, of ours, and she has been, uh, she's been a wonderful supporter. We've, we've gotten money from, from, them, from the embassy as well as from the State Department on a couple of occasions. And uh, what she also says, though, is that the work we do helps, it, it, is, the, it is absolutely soft power working is what it is. It is the idea that culture is important. It's important to all of us. It's something that we all believe in. And, and it is something that is non-controversial. It is something that uh, can build bridges overseas. And she says she sees it. She says she's aware of this, that the work that we're doing is helping her. It's making the Americans um, better received in Algeria, and uh, I can attest to that to some extent, in that, you know, you saw our, our 
friends in uniform. We have interest from all sorts of ministries now who are interested in saying to us, how can we work together? What are the ways we can work together? They have, interestingly, in uh, Algeria, they have the Ministry of Startups. The Ministry of Startups does exactly what it says. We're in conversation with them. The, the foreign ministry is interested in our work too because they're saying maybe we should be working on regional projects. We've, we're in conversation with them on that. So we start to provide um, added value through the work that we do. And that is, uh, for our funders especially, particularly important. All right. So here's another lesson learned. I wanted to, tell, I wanted to hit on some of these lessons learned. It is the value of digital infrastructure. We're doing a lot of this work. As you can see, we build websites, we build databases, uh, we do um, strategy around that. And uh, so we recognize the value of this material. Uh, I'm just looking at my clock. I don't want to uh, stretch this out too long. Okay, so I have some news. I'm a former television news guy. That's, where, that's what I started out as. I'm not an archeologist, I'm not an academic, I'm not an art historian like, uh, like Michelle. What I am is I was a, I was a TV news guy. And on September 11th, I watched the, the buildings come down from the studio, and we had the most uh, um, dramatic days of our professional careers shortly thereafter. This is the news that I wanted to give tonight. We uh, have just been awarded the prestigious Ambassadors Fund for a Cultural Preservation Grant for this year. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's nice to get a hand for a grant, I gotta tell you. Uh, we're, um, we're very pleased about that, as you can tell. We're gonna be working with our friends at the Kizana, at the, uh, at the, uh, the desert libraries uh, in the central part of the country, and um, we will be working on digitization documentation, particularly conservation, and particularly interventions to help with rising temperatures. That area is called the Triangle of Fire. We, found, we, went, we went down there and we, uh, the governor invited us for tea. You know, you go to the Middle East or North Africa, you drink a lot of tea, right? And uh, we went over to see him because of course we wanted to see the governor. And he told us, yes, we now call this the Triangle of Fire. And the Triangle of Fire uh, is, this, is this area in, in the central part of the country where temperatures are regularly up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, 122, I believe. 122, that sounds right. Okay, so we have to, we feel like we need to enter. Yeah, exactly, you're going like this, you're absolutely right. So, uh, so the good news is we have this new grant and we'll be undertaking that, we'll be starting that next month. So we're, uh, we're pretty proud about that. Okay. So we're talking about the value of digital infrastructure and scaling up. I, I say this, I should have mentioned before, there are about 75 of these Kizana in, in Algeria that we have discovered so far. We think there are more. So part of our process is to, is to um, assess this, is to do a mapping of this, is to figure out where, uh, where uh, these are, what their situation is, and to talk to them as best we can before we do any interventions. We need to talk to the people and find out what do you need? What's the thing you need? You know, it's, it's, you can be very far away and maybe you don't have electricity. You certainly don't have cell service, so maybe you need satellite phones. Uh, do you need, um, you know, are there, are there, you know, is what's your water situation look like? We need to find out some of those things. We need to do that kind of work as well. Uh, so, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to scale up, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick um, rundown on that. The first one of these projects I did was in Sulaymaniyah in Iraq. And that was at the place called the Kurdish Heritage Institute, one organization. Second thing I did was three organizations in Iraq. F third thing, uh, third major one, uh, is the six organizations here at the, uh, the museum um, cohort that we just did. With this, with the Susanna, we're hoping to do 75 organizations. And if we can do that, it's a big process, but you know, actually it's, if you, if you break it down, the equipment's not that expensive. We can make it work on a regional basis. We can, you know, we can buy equipment for maybe one out of five and they can share. We've tried to figure out all these ways to do that. Because if we don't do it, if we don't scale it up, it's going to take us forever. If we could spend, you know, if we did these one at a time, we did these as one-offs, you know, our grandchildren would still be working on it. And so if you recognize that this is 
the things are getting hotter. You saw the pictures of those of those manuscripts deteriorating. If we're going to try to intervene, we have to intervene. We have to intervene now. And that's why when I mentioned that this is an emergency, that really is what I mean. So we have to scale up. Uh, I'm going to take us through a quick tour. I, I realize I'm getting on. Uh, this is um, the Citadel in Erbil. That has uh, been. They say it's the the the. Kurds and the Iraqis say it's the longest continuously inhabited location in the world. 6,000 years people have been living on that citadel. Uh, there's others who say that it's not the longest. <laughs> uh, but what we know is that we work here at the Syriac Heritage Museum. The Syriac Heritage Museum, we, we two years ago, we received a million dollar grant from the U.S. Um, Agency for International Development to work with minority communities in northern Iraq. Uh, minority communities in this case is the Syriac community, the Assyrian Chaldean, uh, the Assyrian Chaldean Syriac Christian community, and then the um, and then the Yazidi community. So with these guys, we digit we worked at their, their they have a museum there. We worked there to digitize their collection. We also did uh, video work with them on intangible cultural heritage. That is um, Archbishop uh, Najib Mikhail. He's a very, he's a very, he's an absolute hero of of cultural heritage preservation. He's the man who famously saved so many uh, manuscripts in Mosul from the advance of the Islamic State. Put him in his car, took him across to Kurdistan, got out of town 15 minutes before the Islamic State arrived. He tells an absolutely hair-raising, blood-curdling story about that, uh, which I believe I told last time I was here. I quoted him on that one. This is Lalish. This is the um, Yazidi uh, sacred city. We work with the Yazidis as well, as I said. Okay, I want to tell you just briefly, I mentioned about the Syriac Heritage Museum. That's basically digitization. The Yazidi community is an oral-based community, right? They're, they're, uh, they pass their uh, cultural culture down orally. They don't have a great tradition of publication, of writing. It's just not what they did. They, they did things um, by word of mouth. So they have, there's lots of, there, Yazid, there's a Yazidi community, there's a Yazidi ethnic community, but there's also Yazidism, which is their religion. So the religion isn't written down either. And their, uh, their, religious, um, their religious practice is, is is passed on from person to person. So there's no definitive record of this. In fact, there's no definitive list of what the practices are. So we talked to our friends at Yazda, the organization uh, that I mentioned before, and we said, do you want it, or would you be interested in intangible cultural heritage video documentation? Which is just as it sounds. Intangible cultural heritage, as you know, is is basically practice, cultural practice. So it's music, it's food, it's dance, it's uh, rituals, it's it's uh, songs, it's 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 the sort of things that are non-material, material culture. It's it's uh, tangible cultural heritage and material culture stuff you find in museums. So we asked them about that. And we said, would that be something you'd be interested in? And they said, absolutely. They said, absolutely. We know. We have, we have experience in just a couple of years ago of our community under threat of annihilation. And it is time for us to make sure that we have this material documented. We absolutely must do this. So um, we, uh, established, we, we trained and established, these are our Yazidi um, colleagues who we trained in video production. That's one of the times when being a tele an ex-television producer actually came in handy for me. So. Um, we trained them on how to do video, and they took to it in a way that is absolutely incredible. We had a deliverable. It was, we were supposed to do 30 videos over the course of two years. We did, and when I say we, I mean they did 45. Uh, those are now all we set up a YouTube channel. Those are available for their community. They're available for the diaspora community around the world, so that they can stay in touch with those uh, those cultural practices, even if they're in, you know, Melbourne. Uh, Australia, or uh, you might not know this, Lincoln, Nebraska, the largest Yazidi town in the United States. So, um, so that's uh, that's what we did there, uh, and then uh, and then the other community is um, 
Archbishop Najib's community at the, the Center for the Digitization of Eastern Manuscripts. They're pretty much a standalone. He doesn't need any help from us. He just, we, we got the money and we give it to him and he takes care of everything. So um, that's that. All right, so here's some more lessons. Support of diverse, for diverse voices. You, you sometimes think, we in the United States especially think that it's pretty monolithic. It's not in Iraq. In Iraq, it's a, it's a pretty polyglot, actually, or, poly, or a pretty diverse um, population between the Kurds, who claim to be the largest ethnic group in the world who doesn't have their own homeland, uh, between, you know, you have the contrast between the Sunni and the Shia, but then you have Christian groups, you have Yazidi groups, you have Turkmen groups, you have the Shabbat, you have the, um, you have there's there's eight groups that are officially recognized by the Kurdish regional government, the, the government up that is the semi-autonomous government in the northern part of the of the, of the uh, country. And the idea is that we want to have people know that that there's multiple groups and multiple uh, multiple ways of of living within the Iraqi system, within the Iraqi nation, and that if you know that, you hopefully can learn that you have things in common. You learn that people are just like anybody else. You learn that you can get along. You learn maybe steps towards democracy and cooperation. That is part of the idea there. Intangible cultural heritage documentation, I just talked about that a bit, and then documentary heritage. Uh, the Archbishop Najib has material going back, I think, to the sixth century. He covers all religions as well. And that material goes to a great place, if you've never heard of it. It's called the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library out in Minnesota. And you can see this stuff there. All right, just quickly, this is the, uh, this is the um, National Museum in Aden in Yemen. You know, another place that faces just terrible problems, a civil war that's been going on since 2015. Uh, once, the UN once called it the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Granted, that's before Ukraine and you know, our, our recent um, set of crises. Uh, that, is the, um, that is the museum. That museum was looted in 2015. It was uh, six guys with Kalashnikovs walked in and stole all the gold coins. That's what they did. They were Houthi rebels. This is part, that's, uh, Aden is part of the uh, internationally recognized government territory. So what they asked us was, could you do an emergency digitization? Could you do it really fast? And so we organized this. This is us with our, our Yemeni friends. This is in Cairo. We couldn't get into Yemen. It wasn't safe. It wasn't safe enough. Uh, and um, so we trained them on that. We did that. We expected it to be done in four months. <laughs> and the government shut, the, shut the, uh, the museum down, locked up all the material, and we just had to wait. We just had to wait until they decided it was safe enough for the people to re-enter the museum. It took about two and a half years before we could get back in. It was not on the timetable we wanted, but good, thank goodness we didn't have anything um, that was uh, stolen in the, in the middle. Uh, that is what it looks like today. We're, we've been in. We've gotten things sorted. We've gotten uh, a full emergency uh, digitization accomplished. And I want to tell you something that's really fun which is they, they had no inventory. They had an inventory. They had an inventory from 1980. It was handwritten. It was in, an, it was in uh, uh, a Yemeni dialogue that very few people speak anymore, apparently. Uh, and it was very tough to, to uh, translate. And during our two years of sitting around doing nothing, we thought, well, let's, let's see what we can do. Maybe we can take a shot at this. And maybe we can transcribe this. And at least we'll have some sense of what, what is in there. Well, we did. And we found that there were about 3,300 objects in there. We only found 2,700 objects. Now, we know that a bunch of coins were stolen, but we really don't know. There's other things that are missing. But what we did find, we did find a cache of coins, a separate cache of coins, 7,000 coins, of which 500 are gold. And nobody in the museum knows where they're from. There is no, inf there's zero information on who owns this. Uh, they don't know how it got there. I, I find this amazing. I mean, you'd think somebody's worked there for a while and would have noticed this pile of gold coins, um, but apparently nobody has, and our current project is to try to figure out where that comes from. Now, it's a fun story, and they're very happy about this. They feel like they've, they've, they've found this treasure, 
It's almost like archaeology in the museum, right? It's archaeology in the storeroom. But the thing, that's, the thing that's equally important, I think, and the reason I make this point, is that this is why you have to have the inventory and the digitized information. So you know what the stuff is, so you know where it's from, so you can figure out what's, uh, you know, where, you know, who owns, who's, who's the rightful owner, and where it should be. All right, I'm going to wrap this up quickly. All right, so the lessons learned here is in Yemen, war zone, civil war, uh, you know, a wiped out civil society, no health care. They had a 40% mortality rate at COVID. It was just, it's, it, was, it was awful there. And so what we have to do is we prioritize against risk. So in the case of the Yemen, uh, in the National Museum there, yeah, of course we had, to, we had to get involved with that because this is the stuff that's most at risk. And you have to intervene where things are most at risk. At least that's what I believe. All right, um, that just about does it. I want to just uh, check one fact here in my notes, and then um, I want to ask you if you have any questions. But um, one of the things that uh, I think is important is, the, is, remember I mentioned go before? Well, when I go, I take gifts. Can you tell what I take as a gift? Well, you can see, I think, if you look closely at the photo. Um, so uh, I guess with that, we'll, we'll end it there. I, I, did wanna, I, I do want to say, if there are any questions, do we have time for a couple of questions? Of yeah, great, super. But I want to say something first. First mm -hmm. of all, this was so fascinating. You do such important work, Peter. I, I'm always amazed and I'm always so impressed by you, the way you go on, and you make a change in lives and society. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank, I thank you. I do want to apologize if you heard a noise. I kept my <laughs> all of you. I kept my cell phone open because something you said. We are second program after return post COVID was on November tenth. 2021, how climate change impacted the ancient world, evidence from the equator to the poles with Steve Picard. It's online. I recommend this. It was absolutely fascinating. So, and we were talking the other day just about how climate change impacts civilizations and cultures. And we were talking about Morocco before the horrors in Morocco, which just occurred. So you have, when you see the manuscripts all dried up, think of the knowledge that we've lost and the beauties. I was also amazed, and I did not know this. I'm sorry I didn't. The Kurds are the largest group in the world without their own nation. That's what they say, yeah. That's Amazing. What, that's it. I, did, I didn't realize it mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. So are there questions? Yes, right there. On the first tape you put up, you had on it, and you showed it three or four times, and I was like little crosses. And those crosses are very similar, recently discovered in Stone Age, and they're thinking that that might be the first type of primitive language. Is there anything you could say about that? I wish I could, other than to say it's really fascinating. Can you show, let's take a look at the photo. I'm, I'm happy to run back, which, um... There it is. Oh, the one that you... Again, the one that we... Okay, this one? No, go back. Go back. That's the one that we... Ah. That's... They found out at the base of Stonehenge now, the very same... Well, you know, writing did was was started originally in the I mean it had its birth in the cradle of civilization. That's a Syrian cuneiform. That's what that is. I know because I went to the site. I took that photograph myself. And uh, and so Arguably, that is among the first. There's Peter Friedman. He's nodding along. I trust him if he says that. Uh, so, um, so if uh, if uh, 
if I understand it pro properly, now how, I mean, maybe Stonehenge has cuneiform. I doubt it's got Assyrian cuneiform. That would be a bit of a stretch, I think. Uh, but, um, but that technique, I'm sure it could be uh, one that would be would have been possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I almost hate to ask, but do you have any update on the sites in Syria? Yeah. Uh, from from what we understand, it's pretty devastating. You know, there there was, if you'll recall, during the height of of the so-called Islamic State, they had a cal when they had their caliphate, their so-called caliphate. I don't like to even say that. I don't like to say their name. I don't like to endorse them at all. But, um, but what they did was they had a minister of, of uh, antiquities in Syria who was systematically looting sites. And from, from what we understand, people still haven't been there very much because it's still, you know, it's still uh, 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 an area of conflict. We, we don't go there. We're, that's a little, uh, you know, it's also very hard for Americans because we can't uh, spend money in Syria. We can't invest. We can't. That's uh, that's uh, uh, illegal for us to do that. So we can't really go there to work. But there are others who do. The Germans do, and there's other people who do. The Italians do. Uh, but the reports are bad, and that uh, you know that looting was rampant. And you can you've seen uh, I, I, one time when when I spoke here, I we used to, I used to have well I have I'm sure someplace photos of. It looks like, you know, the, it looks like the face of the moon. It looks like there's craters every six feet where people just went in and dug and dug and dug with the hope of finding something uh, that they could sell. So uh, from what we understand, it's not good. There's not been a survey, a total survey done of it yet. There's this place, the American Schools of Overseas Research, ASOR.org. ASOR they have good information on Syria if you're interested in looking at their website. Yes. I have sorry, quick question. When you're showing the recording of three dimensional images, mm -hmm. the technique that you're using reminds me of the early form of digital tomography of the translate rotate. But your digital camera that you have right now in its panoramic mode produces a three dimensional image in essence. And if you think about utilizing the ever-present phone digital cameras or other digital cameras and just using that as a stationary image on your rotating uh, platform, then you can produce relatively inexpensively a three-dimensional image. So I would think that might be toward your global uh, approach. You're thinking um, in a way that is very similar to uh, the way a number of people are thinking. We have um, a coll colleagues that had a commercial operation called TruePic, which is an authentication uh, photographic um, application. And what they do is you, ta you snap a photo, and if you're on the internet, it goes up and goes through the internet and it comes down in a blockchain in California so that you have proof of where something was at day and date and such and such a time. They're using that in Ukraine right now. Uh, Microsoft and TruePic has, has piloted a program there where they're going to collections probably not dissimilar from what we're sitting in and taking snap, 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 off they go and they group them and they, they catalog them a bit, uh, and they will know then if, uh, if they find, if these paintings were to disappear uh, because the Russians rolled in, uh, and you found that 20 years later, you could establish that it came from that place, from that collection in Ukraine, and you could repatriate it. That's how that works. Uh, so there are people who are doing just that. The, the, the camera phone is, you know, there's, there's those who say it, it will change everything well, I'm, that, that's probably not news, right? <laughs> As a side, may I say that question was asked by my brother-in-law, who's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, I saw something. Yes, yes. Um, In terms of who you're dealing with, what happens when the federal government of that country has one agenda, but the local authority or the local tribal organization has a different because there are two different tribes or two different religions or two different ethnic groups. How do you manage that? Uh, it's, it's a hard thing. 
uh, you're probably identifying that from, from uh, that is a challenge in, in Algeria, in the desert areas. You, you know, the reason they don't get support is because they have, they're, they're not particularly trustworthy of the federal government, of the Algerian government. Mm -hmm. They don't, they say things like, you know, we're better off on our own than we are. We're certainly not going to send our manuscripts off to a federal facility or federal, you know, to their national library in Algiers to get them digitized or get uh, conservation done because they're afraid they'll never see them again. They're afraid they'll be nationalized. And, um, and so as a consequence, that is, that is trouble. Now, I have to say, my friends at the ministry over there are pretty open-minded about this. Mm -hmm. And they have said to me, uh, uh, you know, I've had to have that frank conversation with them. And they say, we know, we know that, you know, that's not a surprise. And we want you, we still want to encourage you to go do this so that you can help intervene on these conservation issues. And hopefully that will, you know, be to so the benefit. Those who are learned people who are on the, uh, the side of seeing things put right, right. I'm talking about the government, the actual politicians, <laughs> who, who really don't care about putting things right. They want history to record their story only. And well, they would like to destroy it. It's, it's, you know, that's a, I suppose that's a human condition in governments everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, we, we just do our best with that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had Evangelist Caricates talk about utilizing the local community for preservation and how important it is. So your question is very apt. Yeah. I want you to know. We have time for maybe two questions more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what the process of trust building was like for you. Did you feel like you got there and the doors were flung wide open and you got to see everything? Mm -hmm. or did you it's it is trust building over time uh, and I start when I when I to be frank about it and to be uh, transparent about it if you are raising money and you have uh, you know, and you're willing to do the, you're willing to do the fundraising. That helps, of course. And uh, but if you go, I mean, this is why I think it's important. As I say, it's important to go with some humility, and it's important to to say, for our Yazidi friends, those videotapes. Despite the fact that I can put together a videotape, they're made in a language I don't understand. I have, I have to. We have to give up control. We, we're, it's, it's, and when I say that to people, they say, oh, really? That's not how the last guys did it. They wanted to have control of everything. They wanted to take the digital records with them back to Spain. They wanted to, and we say, no, 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 this is all yours. This belongs to you. You do what you want with this. We can help advise if you want, uh, but, you know, it's your material. It's your culture. It's your material. That's how we approach it. So that gets us, that gets us steps down the road, too. And, um, you know, and then we, you know, and, and as I say, we're, we're happy to go, we're happy to go visit, we're happy to go back and visit again. And as a consequence, I, you know, just on a personal note, it's very rewarding work. It is. It's rewarding work. You feel like you're making a difference. Thank you, Michelle, for saying that. But you do feel that way. You, you feel like this stuff is, this stuff is going to... You really have to the world. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. So you just said that you need digital copies Digital material with them. You don't take any copy of it. No. As, as a part to if if they want to give it, if they want to, if they want a repository, what we call a repository copy, someplace, we can help arrange that. But we don't, we don't, you know, it's important for us to say that we're not in this to acquire anything, and it's, um, and you know, we often advise, you know, what do we do? Mostly we advise mm -hmm. that they put it up on Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, in their glacier mode, mm -hmm. where it's the least expensive, and they'll know that they'll have something there. That's usually, we always advise that you have, you know, there's a computer saying locks, lots of copies mm -hmm. keep stuff safe. So that's what we advise, you make multiple copies, you have some here, you have some there, you have some out of the country too, possibly, if that's yeah. what you want to do. But it's there, again, it's their decision. It's their decision. We advise on that. But um, the Council on Library and Information Resources is particularly, um, in, this is particularly important to them. They, they feel that under no circumstances should they own anything because it, it does, it can muddy the waters then. Well, at this point, I want to thank you. This is